thank you, Ricardo. Um, it's an honor to be here at uh, the 92nd Street Y, a reading series and an institution that I've long admired. And it's a, a distinct, a true pleasure uh, to be on the stage with Jennifer Egan. We're trying to figure out this beforehand. Um, we've known each other for 37 years now, and we have traded uh, many a manuscripts with each other. Um, I'm going to give a little 10-minute talk uh, that I prepared and then read just two pages from the partition. My first book, The Story Collection Yellow, was published in 2001, 21 years ago. After four ensuing novels, this new collection feels like a bookend of sorts. So I've been thinking a lot about those early years when I was an aspiring writer in my 20s and 30s trying to publish stories in magazines. At the time, I lived in Boston. I was an editor for the literary journal Plowshares, which was a shoestring operation back then. I'd publish a couple of stories by that point, but truth be told, I wasn't really writing that much. Part of the problem was that I didn't really know what I wanted to write about. As an MFA student, I've been told more than once that I should write about the quote unquote Asian American experience with predominantly Asian American characters. I thought the suggestion was in and of itself a racist, that I was being told I shouldn't step out of the ethnic literature box, that I should know my place. I wasn't interested in writing about being an immigrant or setting stories in old Asia. I had no connection to those stories. They weren't my stories. So essentially, my internal reaction to that suggestion was, fuck you. <laughs> I thought I should be able to write whatever I wanted to write, and the ethnicity of my characters was immaterial. But eventually, I had to acknowledge that race did matter to me that I'd faced racism, especially in Boston, and that tapping into my anger and confusion and discomfort with the issue of race could be powerful and generative. I came to this conclusion after a particularly bad year. My mother had a stroke while swimming in a pool and drowned. Two girlfriends in succession cheated on me. The IRS nailed me for $2,000 for forgetting to pay all of my self-employment tax. Every story I submitted to magazines was rejected. I busted a bone in my foot running, and the doctor told me I had to stay on crutches for 10 weeks. I lived in a studio apartment that was a fourth floor walk up, and it was a hassle, a pain, to go up and down the stairs with crutches. So I ended up marooned in my apartment with a lot of time in my hands. That's how I came to write the story Yellow, the first time I addressed being Asian American in my fiction. No doubt being sequestered for so long led to the story becoming a tad long, 52 pages to be exact, over 15,000 words. Now, as an editor myself, I should have known that no magazine would take a story of that length, but like all writers, I was insane and deluded. <laughs> I fudged with the margins and font size and line spacing, <laughs> and got the manuscript down to 37 pages and submitted the story to a bunch of magazines. This was in the era of paper submissions when you mailed photocopies in manila envelopes and included an SASE, a self-addressed stamped envelope for reply, which was also in paper form. You could decipher a lot about how you were doing from the forms of rejection. When you get a small blank form rejection, like this one, that was bad. This was from the Paris Review. When you got one with a scribbled sorry on it, that was better. This was from Grand Street. If you got one with a little note and perhaps the editor's initial or partial name on it, like this one from Esquire, very cinematic, compelling, but not quite right for us. Thanks for giving us a look, A. Period Davis. You were getting there. You see how the size of the form rejections got bigger as they got nicer? 
if you received a bigger size rejection with an encouragement to submit again with the editor's full name, like this one from the New Yorker, sorry and thanks, try again, Karen Kaminsky. You were really starting to cook. <laughs> then, if you got a personal typed letter from an editor, you were really getting close. This was from Michael Curtis, the fiction editor of The Atlantic, about my story, Yellow. Dear Mr. Lee, this is a remarkable piece of work, but it is, as you surmise, very long for our purposes. It is also linear and oddly concluded. I wish that weren't so, because the writing is artful and intelligent, and the themes seem to me worthy. But we are not destined to publish this story, and I'd better return it with thanks and the hope that you'll try again. Someday, if you're interested in lunch, let me know. I'd welcome the chance to meet you. Nice, right? A month later, I got this one from one of the principal fiction editors of The New Yorker. Dear Don Lee, thanks for letting us read Yellow. It is neatly written, precise, and fairly interesting. But for us, it doesn't amount to strong fiction so much as a fictionalized account of direct experience. Literal or untransformed in its detail and then stretching its scope and chronology to make a point about character. It's good for what it's after, but the project seems to us in the line of a rather old fashioned, barely nuanced narrative shaped mainly by the goal of exposing a moral insight. I'm sorry this hasn't worked for us, but your articulate observation is strong. With more attention to the possibilities of compression and elision, setting forth less, your work might imply more and gain in complexity. Again, we're sorry to disappoint you, but thanks for the look. Sometimes it turned out that a personal type letter from an editor wasn't what I really wanted. <laughs> especially when it was brutally critical and oddly mean-spirited and condescending and also presumptuous and perhaps a little racist, saying the story seemed like literal direct experience. The main character works as an engineer before becoming a management consultant, the embodiment of model minority stereotypes, when the story wasn't autobiographical at all. After Yellow, I turned to the novel form, but continued to wrestle with the notion of being a writer of color. I kept wondering, must Asian American writers always have race as their primary subject? Do we always have to make our characters Asian American? If we don't, is it tantamount to some sort of race betrayal? Doesn't limiting yourself to race ghettoize yourself or even perpetuate stereotypes? Being ambivalent about these questions, I've tended to address race head on in one book, then hardly at all in the next book. Yet in 2018, with the particular administration that was occupying the White House at that time, the social political climate seemed to demand, even in fiction, a pointed acknowledgement, if not outright engagement, about what it was like to be a person of color in America. This sense of urgency multiplied in the wake of George Floyd's murder and all the anti-Asian hate associated with the coronavirus. That was the milieu in which many of the stories in the partition were born. Specifically, I was spurred by something my then girlfriend and now wife, Jane Delury, and I learned about the neighborhood she was living in called Rogers Forge near Baltimore. We found out that there were still covenants on the books that restricted dwellers in Rogers Forge to whites only. This inspired a story called Confidants. These are the first two pages of the story, which ended up to be more about class and infidelity than race. Nothing good can ever come when someone asks you, as Solve asked me one summer evening, you know, don't you? Know what? Oh, you don't know, she said, and her face louvered through all the pleasures of an inveterate gossip. 
glee, malice, titillation, relish. I was grilling flank steaks. Kate and I were hosting some of her friends for a Labor Day barbecue at her row house in Rogers Forge, a residential neighborhood just north of Baltimore. The party was a valediction to a good summer in which Kate's divorce had become final and we'd gotten engaged to become engaged. What I didn't know, what Solve now revealed to me, was that Kate was talking to Charlie Rusk again. Charlie Rusk, the founder of a company that produced something called the Host Access Software, applications for mainframes or legacy systems that were quickly becoming obsolete, dinosaurs. Nonetheless, Charlie Rusk had been able to sell the company not too long ago for a bundle of money, enough to buy a small share of the Baltimore Orioles. He and Kate had had an affair. Somehow, her ex-husband never learned about it, though Rusk's wife had. She'd made Rusk break it off, and Kate had been heartbroken. They hadn't spoken in three years, or so I'd thought. Kate told you, I asked Solve. Charlie did. In addition to being ostensibly Kate's best friend, Solve was also ostensibly Charlie Rusk's best friend. Could she have dreamt of being in a more delightful position? He called her, I asked, or the other way around? Neither. Apparently, a week ago, Rusk had ambushed Kate in the parking lot of the new Trader Joe's on Kenilworth Drive as she was opening the trunk of her car. I still love you, he had cried. I still love you. Don't, she'd told him, and had jumped in her car and driven away, leaving her groceries behind in the shopping cart. As she was speeding out of the parking lot, he began texting her, and he kept texting her. Will you talk to me? Please talk to me. I still love you. I never stopped. And after an hour, Kate had texted him back, you can't do this to me. And then he had texted, Elizabeth left me. This had been news to Solve, Russ's putative best friend, that his wife had left him. I can't believe he didn't tell me, she whispered to me beside the grill. I looked across the backyard at Kate. She was sitting in the shade of the patio umbrella, chatting with her friends, not betraying a whiff was amiss. They've been talking on the phone ever since, Solve said. She put her hand on my forearm and bugged her eyes in concern. What are you going to do? Thank you. It's lovely to, I'm not going to say see you because I actually can't see you, but welcome. I'm happy that you're here and happy for all the people who are on live stream and especially happy to be with Don, who I think is actually my first literary friend. As he mentioned, we've known each other a long time. Um, it's uh, almost embarrassing to admit how long it has been. Um, and Don has read all of my books before they've been published and given me incredible um, incredibly helpful advice, and I've been reading him also from, from the beginning, and uh, so it's been a rich friendship with a strong literary undergirding, and um, it's been invaluable to me, so it's really, it's wonderful to share this night with Don. I'm going to just read um, from the beginning, read the early part of one of the chapters of The Candy House, and then I'm looking forward to um, having our mutual interview and also hearing your questions. This chapter is called The Mystery of Our Mother. Looking for the water, okay. Long ago, she told us, when we were just a hope in her heart, or not even that, because she never wanted children, or thought she didn't, a higher power touched our mother's head and said, stop what you're doing, two little girls are waiting to be born and you need to have them right away because the world is desperate for their brightness. So she stopped studying anthropology, which she really did love and maybe would study again someday when you're all grown up and don't need me anymore. We'll always need you. I'll always need you two, that's for sure. I'll try not to drive you crazy with my mommy needs. Till the end. Well, I stopped going to anthropology school and I married your daddy and we brought you into the world. And here you are. It all worked out perfectly. Where is daddy? You'll see him next week. He's taking you to ballet. 
Last time he never came. I'll be here, just in case. He can't make a bun. That's not important, honey. Before ballet? Don't whine, sweetie. He threw Tam Tam out the window of the car. He said she was moth-eaten. That was unfortunate. How could you marry him? Love is a mystery. Does daddy love you? He loves you. That's what matters. He said we were young spendthrifts. Did he now? He said, can we not talk about what he said? We're just telling you. I don't need to be told. I know your father very well. How did she endure these conversations? Of course, our father didn't love her any more than she loved him. He was 15 years older than our mother, twice divorced when they met with four kids, two by each ex-wife. How's that for a rotten prospective husband? But he was charming, a famous record producer, and above all, we later surmised, he wouldn't take no for an answer. Why he wanted our mother to say yes is another mystery. They had nothing in common beyond a taste for beauty, his, and beauty, hers. But she never lived by her beauty. She was the kind of mom who rarely wore makeup, who let her hair grow wild and didn't bother to shower on Sunday, her day off from the travel agency where she went to work after our father stranded her without any money to raise us. The sun gnawed apartment complex where we lived with our mother starting as toddlers in the late 1970s, the first home we remember, seemed to be populated entirely by females, aging B-movie actresses who took deliveries of gallo wine in gallon bottles, and aspiring starlets whose much older boyfriends had white stripes on their ring fingers. The apartments surrounded a garden containing a single gargantuan palm tree, either a relic of some agricultural prehistory of that patch of land or a decorative feature that had bloated grotesquely out of scale with the modest complex it was decorating. The bedroom we shared with our mother faced a canopy of fronds like the fingers of a dozen hands. Even on sunny days, it made a sound like rain. On Sunday mornings, we climbed into our mother's bed to be the monster, which meant lying with our chests on top of hers so that all of us could feel our three beating hearts. Our hair tangled with her hair and our breath melted into hers until we were one creature lying under the moving, whispering hands of another creature, the palm tree. The tree had a name, we told our mother, Herbert. What if it's a girl tree? A girl can be Herbert. Our mother propped herself on one elbow and studied us. There aren't a lot of men around here, are there? Do you wish you saw more of your daddy? No. He loves you very much. We love you. You can love us both, you know. No, we can't. Our parents' marriage collapsed when a San Francisco high school student washed up on their Malibu doorstep, having run away from home and hitchhiked south after our father seduced her on a business trip. We were three and four years old. Our father managed on paper to appear penniless. He left our mother with nothing but us, which by his calculation probably meant less than nothing. But for our mother, who had little else, we were infinite. She loved us infinitely in return and gave us that rare thing, a happy childhood. She never told us why she'd left our father. Much later, he did. On the occasions when our father showed up to take us to ballet, we walked grimly down the cracked outdoor steps from our second story apartment to one of his many cars. Hello, girls. One of you want to ride in front? We shook our heads. It wasn't safe. Everyone knew that except him. How about something to eat? We've got time before your class. We don't eat before a ballet. I can't do anything right with you two, can I? We shook our heads, and he laughed and began to drive. But when he pulled up in front of the strip mall where the ballet studio was, he turned around and peered at us in the back seat. I'm your father. You understand that, don't you? We nodded in stony unison. That's not nothing. That means something. He searched our cold eyes. You don't like me. Why? 
It was not a rhetorical question. He was curious, awaiting a reply. We looked at our father closely for perhaps the first time. His weathered surfer's tan and longish blonde hair, his crooked front teeth. He watched us watch him, and then he laughed. How would you know? You're just two little kids. Some girls might have adored a father who came along occasionally in a showy car, pined for him, tried to be pretty for him, and distract him from his girlfriends who were closer to their age than his, and ultimately become the playthings of other men with similar tastes. That's roughly how it went with our three older sisters, Charlene, Roxy, and Kiki. Roxy was the one we idolized as little girls, lithe and kinetic, cast in dozens of music videos. She'd achieved such notoriety by age 17 that you could hardly fathom what kind of future it was all prelude to. But it turned out to be prelude to almost nothing. Roxy's promise was her main act. She ended up on methadone with hepatitis C. Eventually, only we could see the, sp the flickering specter of her young self flashing and bird-featured like an antic ghost haunting a tumble-down mansion. The mannerisms of heroin, the dull eyes and sleepy movements became her mannerisms. The old Roxy was invisible to everyone but us. One day after ballet, our father told us that we weren't going straight home. We glowered. Does mommy know? Of course your mother knows. What do you think I am, a kidnapper? He drove grimly, our lack of enthusiasm clearly needling him. We played rock, paper, scissors in the back seat and pretended he wasn't there. Hey, try looking around for a change. We were driving along a cliff, the ocean shivering enormously below. It seemed a different world from the parched, flat one we inhabited with our mother, full of glittering cars in broiling asphalt lots. Eventually, we descended the cliff and pulled into the driveway of a house with tiled roofs and magenta flowers overflowing its walls. There were no other houses around it. Rock and roll crashed from inside the house, but our father walked us straight past it to a beach whose fine white sand was very different from Venice Beach, where our mother often took us on Sunday afternoons. Where are the people? It's a private beach. We're the only ones who can be here. Is it yours? Yes, it's mine. Go ahead, run around, have some fun. We stood watching him. Come on, play. When we failed to move, he said, I've never seen a pair of kids who wouldn't play. It's your beach. I'm your father. My beach is your beach. We like beaches with people. You're very tough, you two. Does your mother ever tell you that? We shook our heads. Ah, so I'm seeing the real you. The real you, plural. No, she is. She may think so, but I know better. Visibly heartened by this notion, he unbuttoned his Hawaiian shirt. Our father wore shorts year-round, day and night, but we'd never seen him bare-chested. It turned out that today, maybe always, his shorts were actually swim trunks. Come on, kiddos, he said, taking our hands and trotting us over the powdery sand toward the sea. We don't have bathing suits. You're wearing leotards. That's the same thing. It was true. We each wore a sleeveless danskin with an elastic-waisted ballet skirt pulled over it and the soft leather ballet slippers we'd gotten for Christmas. Wait, we need to take off our skirts. He paused while we slid them off and folded them neatly on top of our ballet slippers, two little piles in the blinding white. I like that, the way you take good care of your things. We stepped into the shimmering water with our father. The absence of a crowd, of music playing on boom boxes, of roller skaters and dogs and cigarette butts and popsicle sticks buried in the sand made it seem like an imaginary beach. We swam with our father. We were seven and eight years old, and we remembered that swim as the first nice time we ever had with him. 
The music had stopped by the time he brought us inside his house, which was big and airy with warm tile floors and ceiling fans slowly spinning and bright flowers and vases and a swimming pool in the middle of everything. We had lived in that house, which might have been why we felt comfortable there, despite its grandeur. A maid showed us how to work the fancy shower and gave us huge fluffy towels to dry off with. We kept the to towels around us while our danskins dried in the dryer. Tell me when you're dressed, our father called from outside the bathroom door. Only after we chanted, we are, did he open it. On the drive home, we looked out over the cliff at a dusty orange sunset. We felt fresh and clean and enchanted, like we were returning from a land in a fairy tale. Down below, where our apartment was, it already seemed to be night. Our mother was waiting for us outside. Gosh, you're even later than I thought, she said. We ran to her and threw our arms around her waist. We missed you. We went to the beach. Our father stood in the shadows until we remembered to turn and say goodbye. I'd like to spend more time with them, he said. He learned pigtails, ponytails, even ballet buns, which he sculpted fastidiously, insisting on starting over again if hairs were stray or sloppy or caught. Other parents smiled at the sight of him pinching bobby pins between his lips. Everyone knew who he was. He'd made the careers of enough rock stars to be a star himself. People joked with him and tried to act like they knew him better than they did. Our father froze them out. He was prim in our company, as if his fame were a dull encumbrance he would have liked to be rid of. Our father's swimming pool looked nothing like the garish turquoise tubs we'd glimpsed in apartment complexes near ours, littered with palm tree debris. His pool was the color of stone, full of lightly salted water, accessible from almost every room in, in the house. The pool was to his house what the palm tree was to ours. On our second visit, he evaluated our, strip, our swim strokes, found them dangerously wanting, and arranged for twice weekly lessons with an instructor in his pool. Occasionally, we stayed for dinner. Eduardo, our father's cook, made fajitas and guacamole and pitchers of margaritas for whoever was around, usually some combination of our four half-siblings, whom we barely knew, and musicians our father was working with. Under a cast iron chandelier whose fat candles dripped wax into the middle of a massive slab of dining table, our father grew loud and loose, a showman we didn't recognize or like. Look at Lana and Melora, he said one night. They don't approve. Everyone turned, and we felt our faces get hot. They're tough customers, those two. They've got me doing pigtails and buns. Incredible, incredulous laughter. I don't believe you, said Charlie, our oldest sister. She dragged her chair next to our father and offered him her golden hair, which fell almost to her waist. Make a bun, she dared him. Our father gathered Charlie's hair in his fists, but seemed unsure at first what to do with it. Girls, he roused us, get me the pins and brush. Serious stickler, came the table howls. Our father brushed Charlie's hair until it crackled in the candlelight. Then he herded it into a shimmering bundle and looped it expertly around, pins pursed between his teeth. Silence fell on the room as everyone watched. Our father slid the pins into Charlie's hair and anchored in place a beautiful, shining bun. It made Charlie look like a little girl, although she must have been in her 20s by then. Laughter broke at the table, and everyone clapped. Charlie's eyes brimmed and overflowed. I don't know why I'm crying, she kept saying as she flicked away the tears, but they wouldn't stop. We knew why. We were getting the best of him. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. I'm going to get a microphone, and then we're going to talk. OK. 
Okay. So, Don had a great idea, which was that we would interview each other a little bit um, before we take audience questions. And I'm going to start by interviewing Don. Um, and Throw me softballs, please. <laughs> I'm not sure if this will qualify. We'll see. Um, so I actually want to read a tiny little section of um, the first story in this wonderful collection that I'm hoping you all buy multiple copies of. Um, there are buy buttons in the chat, I'm told, of the, for the live streamers. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read from, this, from the first story, um, which is called... What is it called? Late in the day. Late in the day. OK. So this is about a filmmaker named Peter Mueller, and um, who has made a film called Late in the Day. And this is just a, a brief, um, a brief uh, summary of the fate of that film. And I'm just going to read a tiny bit. Six months ago, Late in the Day had premiered at the 2010 Honolulu Asian American Film Festival, and the response had been overwhelmingly positive in the beginning. Hailed a breakthrough for APA cinema, a bravura, anti-ethnic, ethnic film, all of the cast members and the majority of the crew Asian Americans, yet with nothing self-consciously Asian about it. No accents, no generational conflicts, no culture clashes, no references to immigration or identity or assimilation, no geishas or comfort women or green grocers, no one using chopsticks even. I'm going to pause there and say that, um, well, first of all, why don't you tell us what goes wrong then for the film? Because that there's that reaction at the beginning, but then things turn, and the way in which they turn is really interesting. Yeah, the, uh, what happens is that he starts getting blowback from other Asians, uh, because um, the main actor is called a Hapa Haole. He's half white and half Asian, and, uh, and he gets uh, all the romance. And so people started uh, complaining about this. Uh, why does it have to be a half white guy here? Uh, and then um, they turn on Peter Mueller, the director, because he himself is half white. And, uh, and they, in the internet chat rooms and everything else, they start talking about how, oh, they met in Guam, his parents, and so his father must have been a GI and uh, when it wasn't that at all. And this story actually came about because I went to the Asian American Film Festival in Chicago, and uh, there was uh, an indie film director named Eric Byler, who did a terrific little film called Charlotte Sometimes. And this was actually his fate. Um, and, uh, you know, it really kind of, uh, he made two more films, but then he's turned to um, shooting actually political action uh, uh, little uh, uh, films instead. And, um, and so I thought that it was interesting because you had somebody who um, at first was getting some success, uh, the movie showed at, at Sundance, and then all of a sudden, you know, what he thought was my own people are, are coming down on me. And what was so interesting to me as a, as a non-Asian American was that it, it, in that one paragraph, I felt like you revealed for the first of many times in this book, and this is the one of the things that I really love about it, that the whole notion of an Asian American experience as a kind of homogeneous or monolithic thing is a stereotype right. <laughs> that only seems real from a distance, which is kind of how stereotypes work. And so I was really struck by that. And I, I felt like you were confronting that, um, that issue head on in this book. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Because in your introduction, you talk eloquently about your own conflicting, conflicted feelings about even having to represent mm -hmm. an Asian American experience. And here, I feel that you've actually questioned whether such a thing really exists as such. Yeah, I don't think that it does. It's uh, such a fallacy to have this umbrella term 
to cover so many different countries and ethnicities, uh, religions, languages. Uh, and so, uh, you know, like I remember once I was on a panel with a couple of other writers of color and uh, the panel was called Crossing Borders. And we were talking about that in the green room uh, in advance and saying, you know, uh, crossing borders, our books are not about immigration even, and why are we on this panel? And, uh, and the moderator um, was, is a, a very well-respected uh, uh, news anchor and uh, whom I, I respected, but uh, he, he asked me at one point, he said, Don, I wanna ask you, why do you think it is that Korean immigrants seem to do so much better uh, economically than uh, other uh, Asians? And I thought, I don't know, <laughs> because I'm not a socioeconomist. <laughs> and, uh, and the weird thing was is that the book that I was promoting at the time took place in Tokyo, and it, it wasn't about Koreans at all. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, it's it's so silly to think about about uh, you know when I was talking about the Asian American experience, and so all of a sudden to say, uh, am I actually a spokesperson for all Asian Americans? Uh, you know, I I certainly don't have that expertise uh, or experience, and you know, so I think that actually that that's one thing that uh, changed for me between Yellow and this book is that. Um, in yellow, I had uh, Korean, Japanese, Chinese Americans as main characters. And, um, and nobody ever said anything about this to me, uh, about cultural appropriation. Um, but I thought about it a lot. And I thought, you know, do like other Chinese American writers or Japanese American writers think, what the hell does he know? about being Chinese or Japanese American. And so uh, I stuck this time with uh, being, uh, having mostly Korean American characters as the protagonist. Although a lot of people will tell you that I don't really know anything about being Korean American either. Uh, well, that's the great point that, you, that, that comes up immediately is that, you know, in a sense, you're, there's an idea that you're somehow supposed to stay in your lane, but what Peter Mueller finds is that even within his lane, he's mm -hmm. sort of under attack for not being really, in a way, pure enough, which is a really problematic concept right. uh, for every, from every angle you look at it from. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've faced that actually when, um, so I, I've had a, a pretty strange background. My father was uh, first in the army and then he was an Air Force civilian. Eventually he went into the State Department. And so I was, uh, I was born, uh, but he's, he was born in Hawaii and, uh, and I was born in Tokyo. Uh, and I had a, um, a Japanese maid and, uh, and two Japanese neighbor friends. Uh, and um, and I, my first language was Japanese until I was four years old. And so I thought I was Japanese. Uh, and then we were transferred to Seoul, Korea, and we had a Korean maid, and so I thought, oh, am I Korean? And, uh, and then I started going to the DOD school on 8th Army Base, so I thought, oh, I, I am American, I guess. And so, um, you know, that my identity has always been fractured or, and uh, split in so many different ways. And, uh, and so that's why I actually ended up calling the book The Partition, uh, because you know, first there's the obvious thing about the DMZ of North and South Korea, uh, but it's about people who are in these kind of liminal spaces uh, with their identities, and they're, they're between countries and cultures and languages themselves. Well, a lot of the stories in this book seem to touch also, and I think, and the first one particularly, on the interaction of the so-called Asian American experience and popular culture, um, cult cultural artifacts that try to depict that experience. And I feel like there's a, there's a huge cultural effort now, at least within America, to, to try to be more open to stories depicting 
experiences of people of color and, and groups that have felt marginalized. And I'd love to hear more of your thinking about, about that. Mm. Um, do you think that it's, is it successful? Does it result in the kind of lumping together or, or expectations of homogeneity that, that you so quickly um, kind of dissolve in, in your collection? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there has been progress uh, in, in uh, publishing and in film and TV, uh, but probably not enough. Um, you know, I remember, I, I love to tell this story, uh, when I was um, on tour for Yellow, and after a reading, uh, a young man came up to me and he said, um, I'm Korean American as well, and I also want to be a writer. And so my question to you is, do I have to write about being Korean American? And I said to him, no, because I'm doing that for you. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, uh, I would be asked those questions all the time, but that, you know, hopefully by when uh, in five, 10 years or whatever, when his career got going, um, that he would be able to move on to other things. And, uh, and, you know, to some degree that's happened. There are Asian American uh, authors out there like, uh, you know, Ed Park and uh, Charles Yu, uh, Susan Choi, Alexander Chi, Paul Yoon, and, uh, and they don't really write about this issue of identity and race. And, uh, and they've been able to just move on. But, you know, um, I mean, the, the the identification always, though, is uh, such and such Asian American writer instead of a writer who happens to be Asian American. And the same thing with characters in both film and books, that it's always that there needs to be some sort of reason for them to be Asian American instead of just being a character uh, who happens to be Asian American. Hmm, yeah. Um, so I want to switch gears for a minute and talk about, because one thing that I think we have in common and one thing that I really love about your oeuvre is that every book is so different from the others. You really have fun t working in different genres. You've, you've written an absolutely a, a thrilling thriller, um, Country of Origin, as you mentioned, that's set in Japan. You've written out and out comedy. I mean, Rack and Ruin is absolutely hilarious. Um, and just basically change the, the kind of tone and mood and feel with each book. And that leads me to wonder about process, which is something that I'm always so curious about. You mentioned being, you know, having a broken foot and having a, a lot of time on your hands and deciding, okay, I'm gonna do this. What does doing this mean for you? What's your entry point and what are the steps? You know, that's actually uh, my one of the questions I wrote down to ask you. Of course, because we always <laughs> want to know. <laughs> because, you know, I, I think it was uh, Flaubert who said that he uh, didn't want to write the same book twice. And I really feel that with you. Um, and But, you know, it hasn't been intentional for me. Uh, it's whatever kind of narrative voice comes up when I'm telling a story. Uh, because, I, you know, in truth, it's confusing to readers, uh, editors, and agents if you don't have uh, a sort of same approach uh, with your books, that if each one is wildly different. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not something that I, I have set out to do, except for this book with the partition um, that, uh, it was coming up to the 20th anniversary of Yellow. And I thought, you know, I, I would really like to update this and, uh, and see how I feel and see if, uh, but also I wanted to see if I could still write short stories because I was writing novels and write occasionally a, a story between books, uh, but uh, it wasn't my medium anymore. And so that's why I, I was really uh, kind of eager to get back into it. And do you outline first? What is your actual nuts and bolts process? I, uh, I have a notebook and I start just writing notes to myself and they're actually mostly questions. Um, you know, why is this person doing this? You know, what is going on? What is their motivation? Um, and then once I start having, um, writing down dialogue, 
in the notebook, uh, that's when I, I know that I can start writing. I'm going to start asking you. Some okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I might slip in another one. We'll see. Uh, so, uh, you know, I remember actually you sent me the manuscript for a visit from the Goon Squad, and I said, this is it. Uh, this is this is the seminal book. Uh, you know, this is definitely your best book. And uh, and I also remember too when um, it came out, and you were you were a little disappointed that it wasn't getting more attention. But of course, eventually it got steam. And uh, and so I wanted to ask you about this one though. You've described it as a sibling novel. To, uh, to Goon Squad. Um, and there are quite a few characters who uh, appeared in that book that appear in Candy House. Uh, Benny Salazar, uh, Lou Klein, Ted Hollander, uh, you know, just to, to name a few. Uh, and their children uh, become prominent. And so what made you want to go back to these characters? And when did you start writing? Uh, these these chapters. Well, I feel like it was. Ne it never really felt like going back. It felt like Goon Squad was felt like a complete story, sort of. I mean, I slipped the PowerPoint in after I had sold it, and it, I felt like it was as much as I could do with that work. But my curiosity was still very much alive, and. It was, and the, and, and the book itself was built around that curiosity, you know, catching a glimpse of something, wanting to know more about it, and then just plunging in and satisfying my own curiosity. And if this, if this piece worked, hopefully the readers as well. Um, so I, and that process was continuing really even by the time I was on my book tour for um, a visit from the Goon Squad. I was working on the chapter called Lulu the Spy then. And there were, but I already knew, it, it wasn't like I thought, oh, I wish I had had a chance to get this into the book. I knew it didn't really fit. It was even further out there in certain ways structurally. Um, it was, it had sort of a different set of concerns. It takes a big leap forward in time. It's in the 2030s. And when Goon Squad came out in 2010, the 2020s were the, the future. Um, so it felt a little too far, but, but the curiosity was really there. And, I, what interested me immediately about that first piece was the idea of taking a character I had written about fairly naturalistically in A Visit from the Goon Squad, a girl named Lulu, who is a very minor character. We see her a couple of times, um, and she's rather opaque. To take her and, and try to draw her, as it were, in a more stylized fashion and use her as a character in a genre story. And I was really working on a spy story. Um, in, in that piece um, now called Lulu the Spy. So that, in a way, showed me certain things that I wanted to keep doing if I kept working on this as a book, which I didn't really know I would necessarily. Um, I, I, as opposed to thinking about concept albums per se, as I was with Goon Squad, where each chapter is sort of like a different song, it sounds different, and yet they come together to tell one story. This time I was thinking more about different worlds, if you will, um, you know, different, different places with different textures, and in some cases, different genres. Like, there's a chapter in here that you would definitely, you could call it YA. It's like a quasi-hysterical stream of consciousness from the point of view of a 13-year-old girl. Um, so I, I guess my prism was a little bit different, and it, it had more to do with moving in and out of, um, of worlds in which characters have different textures. Hmm. You know, I actually do think that uh, this is a very different book from Goon Squad, even though it, uh, it has some of the same characters. And um, the one sign of that for me is that eight of the chapters in Goon Squad uh, were published as short stories in magazines. And only one that uh, you were talking about, the Lulu chapter, came out as a black box in the New Yorker in the form of tweets. Uh, and so it's kind of a, I feel like this book is really much looser. And um, it's very playful and free. And I sense that you were kind of riffing and just having a ball. 
and doing anything that you wanted and you said, I don't have to adhere to any kind of rules or you know, sense of symmetry here. Uh, and um, were there, was that a conscious decision or it just came out that way? And were there other things that you considered and maybe even wrote and then didn't include in here? Oh, yes. I mean, I think that that freewheeling quality um, is, uh, I'm glad it ha it's there, but I can promise you <laughs> it, it, it was not, it, the process was pretty controlled, actually. Um, I would say that there was, I, I'm not sure I've ever had a higher ratio of material I couldn't use than I did with this book. Probably 50% of what I wrote ended up not being usable. Um, for many reasons, I mean, some of it, I wrote a lot of it in 2012 and 2013 in by hand, as I do with fiction, and I actually didn't even type it up. So some of it may have just been that by the time I did type it up in 2016, whatever it was that had seemed exciting to me about some of that material just was, was not there anymore. Um, but also, I, so I have a writing group and a number of members in that group are here in the audience, and I dedicated this book to my writing group because They've been incredibly helpful to me for so long. Um, but as they know better than probably anyone, you know, I bring it, I, I write crappy stuff all the time. <laughs> um, I mean, there are things that I try that really don't work. Um, and so I'll give you one example, actually. Um, the chapter, one of the big technical challenges of this book for me from the very beginning was, how can I write a book that actually can house and contain black box, which felt so extreme structurally. It's in the form of, um, narrated in the form of lessons learned by a spy as she performs her spy mission. Um, and so I was, um, you know, it, 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 it structurally is unusual. It, it, every uh, utterance is 140 characters or less because this was old Twitter. And what happens to Lulu on her spy mission is actually really bad stuff. I'm not focusing on that really in Black Box because of its genre-esque feeling, but she's repeatedly raped, she is shot, um, she nearly dies. I mean, it's, it's really hard stuff. And I thought, okay, if I'm gonna include this in a book, I have to see Lulu after this. And how do I approach her? And I just really didn't know what to do. And so my first idea was that I would write it in the same way. And the idea would be that she can't stop thinking in these short utterances in the form of lessons learned, even though she's now supposedly reintegrated into, she has two children and she's trying to, um, you know, live a normal life again. And so I tried to write it as I did the first one for basically for Twitter, although I didn't intend to tweet it. And oddly, a form that had felt so freeing when I was working on Black Box, which became Lulu the Spy, felt utterly constraining and kind of just an endless downer. Like there was humor in Lulu the Spy, but I couldn't find the humor. And I read this to the writing group, I think more than once. And again and again, I, I think we all felt together like there are moments here, but it's just, it's just not working. And I had poured months into that. Um, so I let that go finally, which is always hard to do when I've poured time into something, but th it's usually a sign that I need to let it go when I feel a kind of relief in walking away from it, which I did. Then I had another idea. It's gonna be a story in the form of the therapist's notes made by the therapist who sees Lulu and tries to help her through this traumatic aftermath. I, just dead on a, I never even brought that into the writing group. That really, <laughs> that's really a sign that it was a non-starter because they'll tolerate almost anything. Um, it just was, it just didn't work. And so I, I re, so I had this ongoing problem. What am I gonna do with Lulu? And then I had another goal structurally, which was I knew I wanted to have a chapter in the form of letters, um, which is a very old genre, as old as the novel itself. It can be a lot of fun. I had never done it before, so it was sort of you know low-hanging fruit. And I thought, but and I hadn't quite found the right story to tell that way. And somehow those two necessities fused: the need to see Lulu, and this idea of an epistolary chapter. And and. I felt free as opposed to constrained, which is always a good sign. And having that 
sort of feel more alive and, and become something that I put in the book helped me to see what was really missing when I tried seeing Lulu these other ways. And the two elements were, one, humor, because there was something very humorless about the, the first two approaches I was trying. And the epistolary chapter is pretty madcap, and there's a lot of humor in it. And the other thing was I needed an ensemble, and that was also missing from this very insular um, quality that these earlier attempts had. And in, this, in the website I've created for the Candy House, I've tried to reveal some of these layers because I think it's, in a way, sort of comforting to know how many times someone has to try to do something before it even begins to work. Um, so if you, you, you can see the, the first page of every chapter as it was published, and if you hover over the first paragraph, that peels away and you're looking at a typed manuscript of the same paragraph marked up, and then that peels away to the first draft. And in the case of that chapter, we go two more layers to see the beginning parts of the, the failed earlier attempts. Mm. In the strictest sense, this is, uh, could be considered a science fiction or speculative uh, book or even dystopian, uh, but it doesn't feel like it. Uh, for, I mean, the first thing is that you don't get into any of the details about how memories are externalized in this cube or else how weevils are implanted in brains. And so uh, I was wondering, were you ever tempted to make up uh, those sorts of, any sort of technological specifics about that? Or did you say, I, I'm just not even gonna go there? I was not that tempted because I had a feeling that my lack of thoroughgoing knowledge of um, sci-fi as a genre would become painfully clear. Um, I've found that to really work meaningfully in a genre, you really have to know that genre. And I don't know the science fiction genre very well. And I also was pretty sure there was nothing very original about my idea. And I've been told that in no uncertain terms <laughs> since the book came out. In fact, there's apparently a Black Mirror episode that includes memory externalization. And, and why not? It's Not only is it just kind of an obvious idea, but it's in a certain way, I think it feels especially relevant and of this moment because you could argue that in a way the internet is, is already doing that. So there's a sense of familiarity about it um, and maybe even relevance about it for that reason. So I, I had no interest in trying to get so specific because I just knew that at that point, the, I felt like what I could bring to this and honestly what I was interested in was just the way that this technology interacts with people's lives and affects their interactions with each other. And in fact, the invention itself came into focus pretty late. Um, it was not like I started with that concept at all. I knew there would be an invention that would be important, but I didn't know what it was for a long time. And I never, I, I never, I had a feeling it wouldn't be very interesting if I, if I looked at it that, that closely. It sounds like, uh, you know, I mean, you're sort of famous for the amount of research that uh, you will do for a novel. And uh, I think back to Manhattan Beach and uh, everything you do with, with the Navy Yard and, and divers. Uh, but did you do much research for this book? I didn't really have to do much yeah. for this book, actually, which was, which was a nice change because Manhattan Beach, as you say, was so um, deeply, and it was, it, research was intertwined with that project from the very beginning. Um, so no, I mean, there's a lot of due diligence in everything I do because I'm not writing about myself. So I'm always outside of my area of expertise and I rely a lot on readers to help me, whether, it is ma whether it's a matter that is relatively small, like for example, at the, I have a bunch of um, academics having a discussion group at, in the first chapter. And I, I knew at some point I would want one of my closest friends, who's an who's a amazing art history professor, to take a look at this and just make sure that the vernacular and just the kind of way that they talk to each other was right. And of course, it was not. Um, <laughs> you know, there were, I had a couple of things. There was one in particular um, where someone says, "Have you read?" something to someone else. And Barbara pointed out, she said, an academic never does that. You don't put someone on the spot asking if they've read something. You just, it's just not done. So that's just one of those, 
that's something that would have made, it would have stuck out to someone who knew better. And so I always want to eliminate that stuff. I write so often from a male point of view. And so it's not like I just hand it to a man and say, so is this what a man would think? But, you know, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always alert to um, in, information about ways that I'm not quite getting it. And honestly, it's as... It's always useful in even a more a deeper way than just oh okay I got to fix that. It helps me. It, it gives me a better sense of what I'm writing about to actually talk to people who who know it better than I do. So that's always part of it. But I would call that. I don't, I'm not sure I would call that research. I would just call that you know part of the process. Why don't you write about yourself? I use your life as a source. And do you think you ever will? <laughs> well. It's funny, I, when I was working on Manhattan Beach, I felt so grateful to people who had recorded their lives in whatever way, either with a tape recorder or part of an oral history or just writing a memoir. And I started thinking, you know, we, uh, that we each should bear witness to our lives as a record for those who will follow us, especially because so much other record keeping that used to exist, like handwritten letters and a lot of handwritten stuff isn't gonna be there. So I do feel like I might ultimately write the, a memoir, but the truth is that what makes writing fun for me is specifically the feeling that I am being delivered out of my life. So it's a little bit of a motivation problem. I feel like when I start edging into material that feels kind of close to me, a sense of dullness comes over me. <laughs> and it's not that my life is dull, although it, I mean, it, it kind of is, really. Compared to the people I write about, it is kind of dull. But it's more that it's just not feeding me in the way that I crave and the way that makes fiction writing exciting. It doesn't have that transcendent feeling of actually being lifted out. So I have to find a way to get around that problem. And I, 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 I look at it as a last resort, which is not a good attitude to have. <laughs> it doesn't bode well for whatever I might come up with. Now, I wonder if we should yeah, glance sure. at these questions. Let's... Here, you take some and I'll take okay. some. This handwriting rivals mine. Um, let's see. Yeah, I got one for you uh, to Jennifer. Would you be an eluder? Uh, and these are the people who decide they don't want uh, to upload their consciousness to the collective. And, well, it's even more and, extreme. Uh, yeah, because have proxies and right because they. It's not. I mean, you can. You can. First of all, you can externalize your consciousness and never upload it. So that's like getting your DNA analyzed but not sharing it. So you don't care to find out if you have relatives, um, and you don't want people to find you. But the, th the problem for people who find this situation intolerable is that even though they have not externalized or at least not shared their consciousnesses to the collective, they are so fully represented by all the people who have that their lives don't feel like they belong to them anymore. So they elude, which means they cast off their identities um, and they uh, take on a new identity and they hire a proxy to impersonate them online so that no one knows that they've disappeared for a while. It's impossible to do that forever, of course, because at a certain point you're supposed to show up in person and that, that isn't happening. Um, but so the question is, would I be an eluder? I, I'm very tempted by, well, I've, I identify with all of them, which I think is kind of the, the, what you have to do to write about anyone. Um, I certainly, uh, can understand why someone would do it, and it's an appealing notion. But I also really understand why someone would externalize their consciousness, because they, there are, I, I posit all kinds of advantages to this. You can find people you've glimpsed once in your life using facial recognition. You can review your childhood from an adult perspective. Um, you can uh, identify an abuser, let's say, if it's someone that you weren't able to see. And actually, most appealingly to me, the idea is you can reinfuse healthy consciousness and memory as if you have a traumatic brain injury or start to suffer dementia. So that's very appealing. So, you know, luckily I don't have to make these choices because it, in a way it all seems appealing. And yet, if, if you, you know, look at it from a slightly different angle, it's, it's also a bit horrifying. Um, all right, I want to read this. Are there any, um, oh, okay, are there, 
Okay, I'm sorry. Well, when you're right. Tell me what you think that says. Uh, anxieties? I think that's right. Okay, I'm going to ask you this. Are there any anxieties that visited you when you were writing these new books? No. Um. No, not not so much for this one because they were short stories, and uh, I mean the the thing about stories is you know they're they're finite and you can see the end of it and you're only going to spend you know a couple of months on it. And where the anxieties are are with novels, and uh, you know because that's going to be two, three, four, five years of your life, and at any moment it could fall apart. You could realize, oh, I've made a terrible mistake, and this thing is stupid. It doesn't work at all, and uh, and you've got to give it up. And so, you know, I, I think the entire process is rife with anxiety. And until you have that first draft and uh, see what you have, uh, you're never settled. Uh, you know, the whole time you're just waiting for it to fall apart. Um, but stories are a pleasure, and. You know, especially, uh, I remember actually late, late in the day, and, uh, and I spent, uh, in the revision process, I spent four hours working on a single sentence. And I thought, what a, a luxury this is to be able to just work on language like that. Whereas with a novel, it's us, you're just trying to pound through and get to the end and make sure that you have a story. That's interesting. Um, Let me ask you one. Okay. Uh, can you speak to your experiences with editors, uh, even though your editor is in the audience? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what can they bring to your process? Well, my editor is absolutely amazing, Nan Graham. She's in the audience, um, which is one of the things that I love about Nan. She shows up, she takes ownership of the project, and she's right in there with me, which is a gift. Um, I, I really love being edited generally, and I also have, as I think is now obvious, you've been reading my work, my writing group has been reading my work. I love getting feedback. It's a really important part of my process. I wrote one novel without that, and it was so off the mark that I, when I would send it to people, this you were lucky I didn't know you yet, Don. Um, <laughs> when I would send it to people, they, they would avoid me. I mean, they literally did not know what to say. Um, so that was me without feedback. <laughs> Well, so I, I really, I, I have to get feedback. And I, I, what I find is that it, it often really hurts. Like it's painful. It's not fun. Mm. I seek it out because I know that I'm better off having heard it, whatever it is. But it is never fun to find out that something has problems. And I often will have a, a, a moment when I'm, I'm feeling really alienated from whoever it is has given me the feedback and sort of invalidating what they're saying mentally. Like, well, you know, I, I mean, basically just enacting a very defensive posture in my mind. But at the same time that I'm doing that, I can feel another part of my brain sort of scurrying and swirling and beginning to come up with solutions to whatever the problems are. So. I seek it out, uncomfortable though it is, because I know the work will be better as a result. And in the end, I'm going to hear it all, and, and a lot that no one anticipated. So I just feel like there, I, I, you know, the more brains I can have um, helping me, the better. And, uh, and my editor is actually one, is, is, comes in later in the process when I've, when I've gone to some of my other resources, and now I want a, a, a fresh set of eyes, and um, she's been just invaluable. Uh, I want to hear what you have to you, say about this. Do you have, uh, does your husband, David, uh, read? He does drafts? read, and he is also here, I think. Um, and he is a, a, a very helpful reader. He read this book twice, actually. Um, he reads very early and very supportively, um, but not, you know, not to the point of saying something is working when it isn't. Um, yes, I, I absolutely utilize him um, and, and love getting his help. 
You know, in your acknowledgments, uh, you thank your sons uh, for luring you into some new realms or something. What was that about? Oh, well, that was really about two things that are really present in this book, baseball and Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, and both of those practices, which I became deeply involved in, maybe a little more baseball than Dungeons and Dragons, um, ended up causing me to think a lot about storytelling, actually. Um, there was a moment where I was trying to get my older son to read, um, and I kept saying, and he said, I am reading. And I said, no, you're not. You're looking at, at columns of numbers. That's not, I, I'm, I mean, read a story, I said. And he said, I am reading a story. And he said, these numbers are telling a story. And he said, this is, a, this is the story of an entire player's career in this box. And he walked me through it and ha how that this guy clearly had, it was hard for him to be traded. His, his numbers would always get worse right after that. And then they would improve if he was on a team. But then he starts getting traded a lot and things start to really go south. I mean, by the end, I was like, oh, this poor guy. <laughs> and I realized, oh, it is a story. And so that, so this is, I will now reveal one thing I failed at. In fact, I, I didn't even know how to start. But initially, I thought in this book, I would try to have a chapter that was only numbers. Um, but, you know, that's tough narratively. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so yeah, so that, and, and Dungeons and Dragons too, you know, it, it, interesting storytelling that involves a lot of numbers because there's a huge quantifi, there's a lot of quantifying in Dungeons and Dragons, assigning character traits with numbers. Um, creating characters with strengths and weaknesses using dice, and then w unleashing these, these creatures, some human, into an imaginary landscape and rolling dice to see what happens to them. All of that led me to think a lot about the paradox between data, which we are obsessed with as a culture, and, uh, and internal life, which remains completely unknowable to each other um, and, and rather unpredictable. And that paradox was something I was thinking about actively as I worked on this book. I think Wait. that's a good place to end. Is it? I have yeah. one more point. Let me ask you one more question. Right. Are, we, are we running out of time? It's, uh, okay, yeah. all right. I could go on forever, but I'm gonna ask you the last question. How do you go about finding a beginning when characters and stories seem to have a prehistory? Mm. That's a really good craft question. That is a, a good craft. I mean, maybe craft. it's like, where do you start? And then how do you deal with prehistory that, that predates the point where you've started? Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually I, I'll answer that by talking about false starts. And uh, for my last two novels, um, I spent a year working on a storyline, doing research, writing the first you know, initial pages, 50 pages or something. And then in both instances, I, um, I decided that they were novels I did not want to write. And, uh, and I mean, you talk about rife with anxiety, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, but then I, I would start another story. And, uh, and what I realized is I wouldn't have been able to write the eventual novel without having done that for a year with the failed novel. Uh, and so what about you in terms of what is it that that well, I I, only, I start with a time and a place, and and I write pretty um, I would say improvisationally without any sense of what's going to happen, and I'm looking for people, of course, and then they start doing things, and that's the beginning of a story. But what I'm looking for in terms of that question specifically, what about the prehistory? that people have, I don't know it until I see things on the page that spark my interest and suggest a prehistory. So I'm following the clues about what people say and do and, and what they suggest about what they come from and sort of the world that made them and about what they might do next, just as you would if you met someone at a party. I'm watching those signals and then following the signals that seem interesting into the story. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. We'll see you outside. Thank you.